now begins part two of this presentation. Um, where we left off was discussing the connections between racism and rape culture. Again, there are higher rates of sexual harassment and sexual assault toward people from communities that have experienced marginalization. During the break, um, you were asked to kind of think about the connections between isms and rape culture. And now we're going to talk about some of those examples um, using uh, racism. So based on what we learned in this first half, let's look at examples of rape culture next to examples of a culture of anti-Black racism and white supremacy. Uh, we're gonna look at how those oppressions uh, and rape culture connect and also why it's important for sexual assault advocates to have this foundational knowledge in anti-oppression, and why this is part of your core training uh, as anti-sexual violence advocates working with survivors. Um, it helps to take examples of oppression, and in this case, anti-Black racism, and locate those parallels to help us break down and kind of understand, but also um, to help us explain to other people. Sometimes we just know uh, there's a connection, but, how, but struggle to figure out how to explain it. Hopefully, this will also help you be able to do that. In the other uh, recorded webinar um, in this assignment uh, called Diversity, Non-Discrimination, Cultural Competency, Anti-Oppression, and Social Justice, um, we're going to look at intersections with disability in that one. Rape culture and racism always blame the victim. Why, uh, here we have uh, my clothes are not my consent. We talked about that kind of in the beginning when we were talking about dress codes. And then again, when we're talking about victim blaming and objectification, right? Um, the image to the right here is Trayvon Martin. On the night of February 26, 2012 in Sanford, Florida, um, George Zimmerman fatally shot uh, the unarmed Trayvon Martin a 17 year old African American high school student. He was on his way back from a convenience store where he bought an Arizona iced tea and a bag of Skittles. In the media, many wondered, you know, why is he wearing the hoodie with his hood up? Um, that it was a cause for suspicion, that it lent itself to a reason uh, for him to be murdered that, that led to this happening. Um, it's also important to know that at the time of the shooting, it was raining. Victim blaming culture asks, why is she wearing that skirt? And why was he wearing that hoodie? It asks, why was she drinking so much? And why was he illegally selling cigarettes? Like in the case of Freddie Gray. and racism tell us where we can be. The picture on the left is Barbecue Becky. He is an individual who called the police on a group of Black people who were legally barbecuing at a public park. Were legally barbecuing. She was branded Barbecue Becky and her image was photoshopped in memes across the internet and maybe you've seen that. She was just one in a string, though, of, of numerous episodes uh, reported across the nation last year, at least at the time of this recording, in which white people have called 911 to report Black people generally going about their normal lives, like napping, redeeming coupons, sitting at Starbucks, shopping, golfing, and many others not filmed or shared on social media that validates this experience of Black Americans, that white people are constantly telling them where they can be. And if they feel comfortable, that white people remind them. This can be uh, easily compared to sexism and rape culture when we talk about street harassment, right? 
that women and gender nonconforming folks uh, out on the street being catcalled or harassed, just doing everyday things like jogging, like um, getting on the bus to go to yoga class to, um, you know, standing on a subway, right? Rape and racism are about bodies. Our culture reinforces that women and black folks' bodies do not belong to them, that they're subject to commentary and control, that they don't have authority or autonomy over their bodies. And this ultimately limits their ability to fully participate in society, right? You're like, I don't want to go out today because I don't want to deal with being catcalled or dealing with people calling the cops on me or cops, you know, interfering with my life, right? Then you're gonna you're gonna reinforce the inequities that make you feel afraid and not want to leave your house when, when you have those days, right? So you're not fully participating in society. Let's talk more about what keeps us from fully engaging in society. Rape culture and racism foster an everyday fear, or as one of my colleagues, uh, Tracy Wright calls, everyday traumatic stress disorder. Eve Insler, the author of The Vagina Monologue, says that most women are busy spending their lives trying to prevent violence or trying to survive violence or heal from violence that they may not be fully participating in society. This also really rings true for young Black men and women in how they are taught at a very early age by their parents um, and by their communities that they are in danger of being killed by the police. The media will show black men being killed by police, which reinforces that fear and encourages more cautious action. Whether or not it ever happens, whether or not they ever even interact with the police, this fear is real, it's daily, and it's always present. This is similar to the self-defense rape prevention efforts that tell women not to walk alone at night and to carry our keys between our fingers to stab potential rapists which although is completely absurd to approach rape prevention in this manner, it's a message that all of us women know extremely well. The feeling and the message in both of these circumstances is not if, but when. Not if I am raped, but when I'm raped, right? Not if I am shot, but when I'm shot or when I'm harassed. Right? Again, this brings us to that inevitability of sexual violence that is part of the, the, the definition of what rape culture is. Living in fear means we are not self actualizing, not reaching our full potential, and not experiencing any real freedom or joy. This can be also similar to the impact of microaggressions. Rape and racism take away our bodily autonomy. We have the right to give or take away our consent when it comes to our body. Full stop, all of us. No one should touch another person without permission. Children should not be forced to hug a family member if they don't want. Women should not be groped on subways, right? We talked about all of those things, established that. Uh, and an extension of that is that Black women should not have their hair touched by non-Black people who feel curious about them, right? Uh, that as a white person, even by asking to touch a Black person's hair, I would be feeding into the narrative that my white hair is the norm and anything outside of it is just abnormal. When I indirectly assume that white hair is the default, I center myself and I further that divide. Again, this is about our bodies. Our culture reinforces that women and Black folks' bodies do not belong to them, that we don't have that authority or autonomy over our bodies, and that we don't have access to what our bodies need, like birth control, clean water, as exemplified by this man holding the Flint, Michigan sign here, abortion, fresh fruit and vegetables in the case of redlining districts, healthcare, physical bodily safety, and just the right to be alive, to not be killed, to not be raped, right? 
we need to ask ourselves as a society, whose body is worthy of clean water? And if the answer is not all people, then we're uh, then somebody is being marginalized. And it's always people who are um, marginalized by a particular historical oppression, right? Worthy of health. Who is making decisions about their own health and their own body? Like reproductive justice, like um, transgender individuals who need access to um, gender affirming uh, hormone treatment. What we consume based on the stores that are available in our neighborhood. And, and how we control who touches us. Right? Ape culture and racism decides who has access to justice and who is believed. Black women and girls sit at the intersection of anti-Black racism and sexism. This is often referred to as massage noir, or hatred of Black women. Black women disproportionately experience violence at home, at school, on the job, and in their neighborhoods. Black girls and women are more likely than any other group of people in America to become victims of sexual violence, according to the US Department of Justice. Racial disparities pervade the education and criminal justice system, right? We are talking earlier about how rape culture is within the school systems and structures and the disparity in legal systems for rape victims. And looking at how this is compounded when um, the survivor or the girl is, a, is black. A 2017 study from the Center on Poverty and Inequity at Georgetown University Law School found that uh, black girls are viewed by adults as more sexually mature than white girls in the same peer group. This means when black girls are victims of sexual assault, they are less likely to be believed because adults view them as older than they actually are. Black girls are in this way robbed of their presumption of girlhood, their, inner, their innocence and their sexual virtue. This is problematic uh, on, on huge levels, right? And uh, fosters so much um, uh, access to justice, like in the example of um, R. Kelly. Uh, in February 2019, R. Kelly, or Robert R. Kelly, uh, the R&B singer, was indicted and arrested on 10 counts of aggravated sexual abuse of four victims. This is after 25 years of fairly transparently abusing underage black girls. Surviving R. Kelly is a lifetime television documentary dealing, sex, dealing with um, detailing the sexual abuse allegations against American singer R. Kelly. It aired over three nights in January of 2019 and because of it, R. Kelly's record label, RCA, dropped him shortly after this docuseries. And finally, on April 22nd, 2019, R. Kelly was formally charged with 10 counts of aggravated criminal sexual abuse. He had already uh, been party to civil actions and other criminal investigations uh, prior to this. Uh, and in uh, what we learned from surviving R. Kelly was that a jury, a juror from his 2008 child pornography trial said that he dismissed testimony from young black girls simply because he didn't believe or like them. He flat out admitted to dismissing their accounts because he said he didn't like the way they looked, dressed, or sounded. This lack of access to justice and believability of black women and girls is thus exploited by perpetrators. In 2015, Daniel Holtzclaw, an Oklahoma police officer, was convicted of 18 counts involving eight different women. Holtzclaw was accused of sexually assaulting multiple African-American women over the period between December 2013 and June 2014, targeting those from poorer, majority Black portion of the city. Holtzclaw ran background checks on women 
with outstanding warrants or other criminal records and methodically targeted those women. The victims were deliberately chosen by Holtzclaw for these reasons, because they would not be believed if or when they came forward. The mainstream media gave Holtzclaw's trial um, for this serial rapes uh, relatively little attention. Uh, in the absence of the national attention, two Oklahoma City women um, formed the group OKC Artists for Justice to bring more attention to the case. Uh, these victim stories need to serve as an important intervention in conversations about anti-Black state violence, rape culture, and the vulnerability of sex workers, uh, ex-offenders, and current and recovering drug addicts to state and state-sanctioned violence, people at multiple intersections. Speaking of intersections, Kimberly Crenshaw introduced the theory of intersectionality 1989 in her paper University of Chicago. Um, the main argument of her black feminist paper is that the experience of being a black woman cannot be understood in terms of being black and of being a woman uh, considered independently, but must include the interaction between the two, which frequently reinforce one another. Crenshaw's focus on intersectionality is how the law responds to issues that include gender and race discrimination. The particular challenge in law is that anti-discrimination laws look at gender and race separately, and consequently African-American women and other women of color experience overlapping forms of discrimination and the law, unaware of how to combine the two and leaves women often without justice. In short, although racism and sexism readily intersect in the lives of real people, they seldom do in feminist and anti-racist practices. The history of rape in the United States is a history of racism and sexism intertwined. Rape was an important tool of white colonist violent efforts to repress native nations and during slavery, both white and black men raped black women with impunity. After the Civil War and during Reconstruction, white mobs lynched numerous black men, up charges of sexual assault of white women, and the specter of lynching terrorized the black community. Long before Rosa Parks became the patron saint of the bus boycott, she was an anti-rape activist and investigator. Buses were the sites of sexual and racial violence for black women who made up the majority of the writers. Buses became the target of black activist protests because they were the most visible vehicle of the system that abused African Americans daily. It was organized, led, and sustained by these very women, the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott. And it was rooted in Black women's demands for, the for their bodily integrity. Although data is limited because of underreporting, right, that we talked about earlier, that women of color are at the greatest risk for rape. Only by aggressively addressing both racism and sexism will women of color and white women be able to obtain real justice for sexual crimes suffered in this country. From Reese Taylor to Anita Hill and now Tarana Burke, who's the founder of the Me Too movement, Black women have been leading this anti-sexual violence movement. In general, understanding the multiple levels of oppression, our history, and the contributions of Black women can help advocates and programs consider our more culturally relevant services uh, the impacts of historical trauma on sexual violence victim, victims as well as communities, and a more intersectional approach to our work. This is the end of this lesson.
take a few minutes to write down some of the ways that rape culture manifests in everyday experience. In relationships, in systems, in society. Think about workplaces. Think about media and the television show. Reflect on sexual violence as it intersects with marginalized identities. We focused on the Black community here in this presentation, but what other communities do you see impacted this way? What do those intersections look like? Bring your list with you to the first session of CORE. And take a break after this presentation. Write down your reflections and then take a break and do something else for a little while. It's important to take care of yourself in whatever way that you need to, by grounding yourself, by breathing, by taking a shower, by going outside, as the subjects that we're gonna discuss continue to be challenging. But particularly talking about really big systems that harm and dehumanize um, communities that we know or communities that we're a part of and the society that we all live in be really big and heavy, uh, hard to grasp and um, frustrate us. So make sure and take care of yourself.